doesn't say once in a while, occasionally, twice a year, at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Well, there's a lot of lessons in that one little verse. But we have to realize that the devil is continually roaming around looking for someone that he can destroy or devour. He obviously can't do it to just anybody because it says he's looking for someone that he might do that to. We have to be smart enough not to open doors for the devil. God spoke to my heart a few years ago and he said, you can forget about open doors. The devil's looking for any, even a little tiny crack in your life that he can crawl through. The more God blesses you, the more responsibility he gives you, the more of God's anointing, power, and authority that's released in your life, the narrower your path must become. You may get by with things one year that next year you won't get by with and the next year you won't get by with things you might have gotten by with that year. If you look back, you know that there were things that maybe you did five, ten years ago that you didn't feel any conviction at all about. And now, if you try to do some of those same kind of things, I mean, God deals with you. Our walk with God is progressive and God doesn't deal with us about everything all at once, but He expects us to keep making progress. God wants to bless us. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But the devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You have an enemy. And sad to say, sometimes he knows us better than we know ourselves. The devil knows exactly what it takes to steal your peace. He knows what button, buttons to push to get you upset. And we need to know ourselves. We need to watch our own selves and see what kind of things is it that the enemy uses to upset us. And we need to pray in those areas and be even more determined that we're not going to give him those open doors. You have authority. As a believer in Jesus Christ, you have power and you have authority. But you have to exercise it. You can't just be passive about it and hope it works on its own. You have to walk in that authority. You have to let the devil know that you know that you have authority. Now you see, that was something 30 years ago as a Christian that I didn't know either. I didn't know that I had any power to do anything about anything that was going on in my life. I prayed, but I didn't pray bold, aggressive prayers. I never ever had one time in my whole life ever taken authority over the devil. I had never told him to shut up. I had never told him to get behind me, to get out of my life. I had never said, I resist you, I rebuke you because I didn't know that I could and I didn't know that I needed to. Now, some of you may know that you have authority as a believer. Some of you, maybe this is brand new news to you. But even if you do know it, we all need to be reminded once in a while that we don't have to just lay down and let the devil walk all over us. Luke 10, 19, if you'll go there. Behold, I have given you authority and power. Say authority and power. Don't you like those words? And he didn't say, I will give it to you. He said, I have given it to you. Say, I have authority. Say, I have power. <laughs> say it again. I have authority. I have power. To trample upon serpents and scorpions, and I have physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. Wow. 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 So some people might say, well, if I've got all this authority and power, then why is the devil walking all over me? Well, maybe you're letting him. Maybe you've not gotten fully committed to kingdom life yet. 
Don't mean to be insulting, but maybe you've still got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Sometimes we like to be Sunday morning saints and Monday morning sinners. Sunday morning warriors, Monday morning whiners. Our walk with God is progressive. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Well, my levels of obedience have increased as the years have gone by. I obey God now a lot quicker than I did 25 years ago. Back then, it might take him three weeks to talk me into giving away an extra $10. Now all God has to do is just barely touch me in areas like that. And I know better than to disobey him because I know that God's never trying to take anything away from me. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need my stuff. So therefore, any time that God leads me to give something or to do something extra, it's only because there's something He wants to get to me that I've asked Him for, and I'll never have it if I don't sow the seed that He leads me to sow. Well, I loved Jesus 30 years ago, but I love Him a lot more now than I did then. And it's seen in my levels of obedience. You see, some people want to have all the blessings and almost no commitment. Being a victorious, authoritative, powerful, stomp on the devil's head Christian is a full-time job. One little 20-minute sermonette on Sunday morning is not going to keep you in victory. You're going to have to love the Word. You're going to have to live in the Word. You're going to have to put some time into your walk with God. You're going to need to study. You're going to need to pray. You're going to need to say no to things that keep you from having time with God. Remember, the promises of God are for whosoever will. Why are some people closer to the Lord than others? God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't just say, well, you I'm going to be real close to, but you, there's going to be a big distance between us. You will really enjoy my presence and, and walk in my presence, but you'll never know my presence. I believe it's determined by how much time we're willing to put into our relationship with God. I said, I believe it's determined by how much time we are willing to put in to our relationship with God. Now, you know, we have a decent Friday morning crowd here today, but as far as I'm concerned, there should never be an empty seat in any kind of a meeting like this. You know what? If there was a, a music concert here, it'd be full. And if there was a ball game here, it would be full. Well, the fact that it's not full just says plain and clear that people don't care as much about spiritual things as they do about natural things. People will pay $65, $70, to go to a music concert and they'll buy the ticket four and five months ahead of time. And then when a, when a minister tries to receive a love offering, You know, we shouldn't be like that. We should love the Word more than anything. And we should appreciate the spiritual things that God deposits into our life more than we appreciate anything in the natural. If you're willing to put more time into your relationship with God, you will find that as the months go by, you will be closer and closer and closer to the Lord. And somebody else cannot put your time in for you. <laughs> This is not something somebody can put on you. It's something that you have to do. Well, I just don't have any time yet. You've got just as much time as everybody else does. There's one thing that's for sure. We've all got 24 hours a day. Nobody gets any more. Nobody gets any less. And once you've used up one of your minutes, you will never get it back again. And so you have to make sure that you use it for something that's going to produce something in your life that you want to deal with later on. Well, I wish I was close to God. I didn't get close to God by wishing for it. Amen? The devil hates you. Do you understand that? He hates you. 
He wants to destroy you. He wants you to be miserable. He wants you to be a Christian with a bumper sticker and no fruit in your life. So everybody can yell, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. Why would I want to be like you? You look worse than me. He doesn't want us to have joy because somebody else might get infected by it. He doesn't want us to have peace because somebody else might crave the peace that they see us with. He doesn't want us to be blessed. He doesn't want us to look like we have any power and authority. I mean, you think about the mental image that most people have of Christians. Just trying to make it through till Jesus comes back to get me. Can't wait to get to heaven. Well, Jesus is not like that. He's a mighty warrior, the captain of the host. And the Bible says that all principalities and powers are under his feet. And we are his body, therefore the devil is under our feet. Go to Ephesians 4. Verse 26, I'm going to give you a couple examples of how we open doors for the devil. You got to do your part. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. When you're angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or indignation last until the sun goes down. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. Give no opportunity to him. Now, you know what that's saying, just as plain and simple as it can say it, don't go to bed mad. If you do get angry, which is interesting to me that he's not saying that it's wrong to feel anger. You're not in sin if somebody mistreats you and you feel angry about it. You're in sin when you act on that anger and take matters into your own hands, refusing to forgive and trying to vindicate yourself when the Bible says plainly that God is our vindicator. Don't go to bed mad. Well, how many times in each of our lives have we gone to bed mad and sometimes with the person we're mad at? Are you like me? If you're mad at your husband, can you sleep on the seam of the mattress rather than touch him all night? It's amazing the small amount of bed space I need if I'm mad at Dave. And I've laid in bed and frozen half the night rather than ask him for any of the covers. I wouldn't, I'm not asking him for any. I wouldn't touch you. I would not ask you for anything. Well, you know what I think we need more of, too, in the church? We need a little more reverential fear and awe of God. To be honest with you, if you want to know the truth, I'd probably be afraid to go to bed mad now. I'm not afraid of God, but I have a reverential fear that He means what He says. And I know the devil does not like what I'm doing. And I remember when God said, you can forget open doors. The devil's looking for any tiny crack he can crawl through in your life. And since I know this scripture, I'm responsible to act on it. And no matter how I feel, I cannot go to bed mad. If it means swallowing my pride, if it means apologizing when I don't even think I was wrong, whatever it means, I have to do what the Word says if I want the door to stay closed to the devil in my life. Yes, I have authority over the devil, but I can't give in to him one minute and try to take authority over him the next. I can't act like the devil on Monday and on Tuesday try to take authority over him. Come on now. You're not sure about that one, are you? <laughs> See, you know what we think? We think resist the devil means that we're not ever supposed to have a trial. Well, I've got a problem, so I resist the devil. I'm a child of God. And I shouldn't have this problem. This is not right. I'm a person of faith. We're always resisting our circumstances, and to be honest with you, the Bible never tells you to resist your circumstances. Did you know that? The Bible doesn't tell you to resist circumstances. It tells us to resist the devil. And you know what I really felt like God spoke to me one time? 
You don't need to resist the circumstance. You need to resist acting like the devil during the circumstance. Because what are we supposed to do in hard times? We're supposed to remain stable. Paul said, I've learned how to be content whether I'm abased or abounding. One of the greatest goals of every believer should be to be stable. Not up and down, up and down, up and down. Happy when things are good and sad when things are bad. Glad one day and mad the next. We need to seek and pursue stability. Paul didn't pray for the Christians that they would never have a problem. You know what he prayed? I pray that they will endure everything that comes their way with good temper. And I pray that over our partners probably at least two or three times a week. That you will learn to endure everything that comes your way with good temper. Because you see, it's really not the problem that bothers us. It's the way we act that bothers us. It's not the problem. It's us getting upset about it. If, if we can stay the same no matter what's going on, then for us it's just like it wasn't even happening. Then we become like Jesus who took a nap in the boat during the storm. And everybody else was running around having a fit. Well, they were all upset and they were in the same storm Jesus was. But he wasn't bothered by what was going on because he remained the same. We have to stop letting what's going on change us. Make your mind up that no matter what the devil does, you will not be moved. Go to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Paul says, if you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence and with the approval of Christ the Messiah. To keep Satan from getting the advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. So what's Paul saying? He said, I forgive people not because I feel like it, not because I think it's fair, not because I want to, but to keep Satan from having an advantage over me. That's a good reason to forgive people. We have to stop doing what's right based on whether we feel like it or not, or whether it's fair or not. You know what? There's a lot of things in life that are not fair, but God is a God of justice. And if we will face an unfair circumstance and remain the same, God will exalt us in due time. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't mean go around looking like this all the time. Oh, I'm a humble Christian. I just don't ask for much and I don't want much and I'm just humble and just waiting to go to heaven. Oh, I hate that kind of attitude. That's, you know what humility is? Humility means you do what God says whether you feel like it or not. Humility means that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and we stay where He puts us whether it's comfortable or not. Amen? And then in due time. And what is due time? Well, it's usually when the circumstance, the stinky circumstance you have in your life has been sufficiently used to do the work in you that God wanted to do. Did you hear me? <laughs> you know how our flesh dies? The Holy Ghost in us begins to deal with us. And then because we normally don't listen just from that, he gives us a circumstance from the outside. The circumstance presses us this way. The Holy Ghost presses us this way. And in the process, we get crushed. It's called brokenness in the Word of God. And it's not a bad word because God knows how to break us in the right places. So we become pliable and moldable in His hands. So we're the real deal and not just some phony with a bumper sticker who doesn't live the life. We got to get this out of Sunday morning and into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We've got to live for Jesus, not just go to church. When I ask somebody, are you a Christian, and they say, I go to church, I already know we got a problem. 
I can go sit in my garage all day. That never makes me a car. <laughs> Just because you sit in church, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a real Bible Christian. Pressing on. You have to resist the devil at all times. Well, I don't want to do it all the time. Well, sometimes I just get tired. I just get weary. I get worn out. I mean, is there ever going to be an end to this? Well, that's exactly what Satan is counting on you. He has wearing out tactics. And he's counting on you to get weary and give up. You need to be the kind of person that says throw your best shot, but you're not going to wear me out. Devil, I'm going to outlast you. I am going to outlast you. You know what? I have a testimony. And you know what the most powerful part of my testimony is? It's very simple. I'm still here. Amen? How many of you, that's your testimony? I'm still here. You know, a lot of people think they don't have a very powerful testimony. Well, the next time somebody says to you, will tell me your testimony, say, I'm still here. I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I'm still in the program. I still love God, and I still hate the devil. Well, I just want to remind you that we can be pitiful or powerful, but we can't be both. That was a very, very important lesson for me to learn, and I think as you keep it in mind, it's going to help you also. Today we have a wonderful resource offer. It's a package which includes a DVD called Be Aggressive and Bold, and my book, Eight Ways to Keep the Devil Under Your Feet. So I really want to encourage you to be bold, because I believe that God has given you a courageous spirit. Stay tuned, get all this information down, and remember that we love you, and we want God's best for you. A DVD by Joyce Meyer. There's no situation that's too big for God. So no matter what you're facing, decide to stand boldly on the Word of God and rise up in faith. Request your copy of Be Aggressive and Bold today for a donation of $25 or more. And when you do, you'll receive the book, Eight Ways to Keep the Devil Under Your Feet as a free bonus gift. Call today toll free, 1-800-727-9673 or log on to JoyceMeyer.org. I remember one day Dave and I were discussing something and you can tell when a discussion is headed toward an argument <laughs> because voice tones begin to go up one octave at a time body language changes facial expressions change we need to get smart enough to cut those things off because before they get into a full-blown three or four day ordeal and so Dave and I were disagreeing about something, and he said this, and I said that, and he said this, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, shh, down in here. Well, <laughs> I had Dave in my face, and I had the Holy Ghost, and I just had a few seconds to make some kind of decision. And I thought right then, my only salvation is to get out of this room. <laughs> and I said to Dave, I'll be right back. And I ran down the hall, locked myself, I did this, ran down the hall, locked myself in the bathroom, stuck my face in the bath towel, and went... <clears throat> <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. I wasn't yet where I needed to be. I still needed to have my fit, but at least I did it in a bath towel. <laughs> I wasn't where I needed to be, but thank God I wasn't where I used to be. Go to Isaiah 40. I know these are familiar scriptures, but 
I was looking at these again this morning and I just thought, wow. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary. There is no searching of his understanding. God never gets tired. He gives power to the faint and the weary. And to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it abound. Even youths shall faint and become weary, and selected young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. There's no human being that never wears out. God's not expecting us to have no limits and to never come to the end of what we feel that we can do. But here's the answer. God doesn't get tired. People do. But God gives strength and power to those who go to him. But they who wait upon the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift up their wings. They shall mount up close to God as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint or get tired. So when you feel like you're going to faint, run to Jesus. God, I need you to help me. When you feel like you're about to lose your temper and get into some big mess you don't want to get into because you've already been around that mountain 500 times and you know what it looks like, run to Jesus. I'm telling you the truth, church. We don't run to Jesus enough. Don't run to the phone. Run to the throne. We're really good at running to the phone and calling our friends. Well, I'm just... Well, what do you think I should do? Well, you know what? Most of them don't even know what they're doing, let alone be qualified to tell you what to do. <laughs> Mindsets are very important. Some people fail because they set their mind to fail. Don't ever say to God, now if I don't get a breakthrough today, this is the last day I can survive. <laughs> this is it, God. I'm giving you another half a day. <laughs> you have to set your mind. I don't care what I have to go through. I don't care how long it takes. I will outlast the devil. And when Jesus comes to get me, he will find me doing my level best to serve him. I may not get it all right, but I'm never going to quit and I'm never going to give up. And you have to affirm that to yourself. Let me tell you something. You're talking to yourself anyway. You might as well start saying some stuff that's going to help you. You talk to yourself more than anybody else. It's called self-talk. We have a running conversation going on with ourselves inside of ourselves. And that's your mindset. You're setting yourselves for victory or defeat. Get a right mindset. Set your mind. The Bible says in 1 Peter 4 that we are to have a mindset that I will suffer rather than fail to please God. Wonder how many people think like that. God, I can't suffer. Now, God, I, you know, I can't stand that. You know what? There's a whole lot more to you than what you think there is, and you can put up with a lot more than what you... You know, it's amazing to me what the human being can endure. Let me tell you something. You can do whatever you need to do. You've got what it takes. You have got what it takes. And you don't have to be trapped in your past. And when you fall down, you can get up again. The Bible says the righteous man falls down seven times and rises up again. You just keep on getting up, just like the Energizer Bunny. You can knock me down, devil, but you're not going to knock me out. Yeah. 
You know, sometimes we get so bad, we have our little emotional fit and we give up for two or three days. But you know what? You're not ever going to give up permanently because God's not going to let you. Set your mind and keep it set. There's examples all over the Word of God. Paul said, a wide door of opportunity opened unto me and with it many adversaries. Paul said, this is our appointed lot. What can a Christian expect? I'll tell you the truth. And I think if we tell the truth and people know what they're getting into ahead of time, they're more likely to succeed. I am not going to tell you that if you serve God, you will never have any problems. That's dumb when people tell you that. Nobody has enough faith that they can avoid every kind of opposition in life. You can overcome it, but overcoming it doesn't necessarily always mean getting rid of it. It means you can learn to be stable in the face of it. You know what you can expect as a Christian? Abasing and abounding. Abasing and abounding. Time is when they're not, things are not so great. Times when things are wonderful. And you know what I've discovered in my life? God is in charge of the abasing and the bounding. The devil is not. God told Satan just how far he could go with Job and where he had to stop. And I believe that everything works out for our good. Even though we don't understand what's going on, God's got his hand over us. He's got his eye upon us. He never allows more to come on us than what we can bear. A promise in the Word of God. I will never allow more to come on you than what you can bear, but with every temptation, I will also provide the way out. That's a promise from God. Another promise from God. What Satan meant for your harm, God will work out for your good. A promise from God. You know, people may mistreat you temporarily, but they'll never get by with it permanently. Eventually, God will recompense you. The Bible actually says in, in Isaiah 61, 7 and 8, that God will give us a twofold reward for our farmer trouble. I call it double for your trouble. Abasing and abounding. Abasing and abounding. Things don't go my way one day. The next day, something awesome happens. God knows we've had all we can take, and when we've really had all we can take, then He comes in with some big blessing, and it refreshes us, and we're just like, oh, wow, glory to God, I love being a believer. <laughs> That's what we got to get over. Paul said, I have learned how to be content. Whether I am abased or abounding. I have learned in all things the secret of being content. And you know what he said content means? Satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted no matter what state I'm in. I love that statement. In other words, contentment doesn't mean I never want change. We all want to see change in our lives and our circumstances. But while we're waiting for God to change what's going on now, we can enjoy where we're at on the way to where we're going. See, the, the area where the devil really just rips us off is with these when lies. Well, when I retire. Well, when the kids get grown. Well, when my husband changes, I can be happy. When I have more money, I can be happy. No, honey, you can be happy right now. And if you don't get happy right now, you won't be happy over there either. <laughs> Got to resist the devil at all times. Satan brings mental attack. He brings physical attack. I just recently finished writing a, a book on taking care of your body, taking care of your whole being because you're the house of God. And interestingly enough, right after writing it, I had an attack on my body. Duh. I'm going around, what? what is wrong with me? I don't know what's wrong with me. I haven't felt this bad in two years. Man, you know, I used to have this and I got over that and now I got, what's, what's going on? And then all of a sudden it's like, uh, duh. 
I just wrote a book on how to take care of your body and having good health. It's called Look Great, Feel Great, or Feel Great, Look Great. Which one is it? <laughs> look Great, Feel Great. Doesn't that sound good? Look Great, Feel Great. You can look your best and you can feel your best if you learn how to respect yourself and take proper care of yourself. Amen? A wide door of opportunity opens and with it many adversaries. But we are more than conquerors. What does he say? Right in the midst of all these things we are more than conquerors. Not when they're over. That doesn't prove anything. If we're happy, when our circumstances are happy, that makes us no different than the world. An unbeliever can do that. But to be stable and to keep reaching out to other people while you're hurting is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Did you hear me? To keep reaching out to other people when you're hurting personally is one of the most powerful things that you can do. We have power. We have authority. You've got to resist the devil at all times. At all times. Something else you've got to do at all times is bless the Lord. Psalm 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times. Ephesians 5.20 says, at all times and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All the time. All the time. You know, when you hurt so bad that you don't even think you can pray, and I know, what's that, I know what that's like. Don't we sometimes hurt so bad we don't even think we can pray? You know, you can thank God with tears streaming down your face. God, I'm hurting so bad I can't hardly stand it. But I praise you. And I thank you. And I believe that you're good. And I believe you've got a good plan for my life. And I don't understand what's going on right now, but I trust you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Thank God in everything, no matter what the circumstances might be. Be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus. Church, let me tell you something. We need to be more thankful than what we are. You want to run the devil off? You want to, you want to be taught today how to deal with the devil? I mean, open your mouth and get thankful. It drives him nuts. He hates a praising Christian. He hates a worshiping Christian. That's how it, worship wins the war. Worship wins the battle. God told Jehoshaphat, you don't even need to fight in this battle. Take your position, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And you know what Jehoshaphat did? He got down on his knees and started to worship God. That's your battle position. Now I got to get up. That's a little harder than it used to be. <laughs> it's such an amazing story about Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles. He had enemies coming against him. His heart began to fear. He set himself to seek God. The prophet came. The battle's not yours but God's. Take your position, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. He started worshiping God. He sent out singers to sing. He sent out musicians to play, and he kept worshiping God. You know what the Bible says? The enemy became so confused that they killed each other. Come on, praise confuses the devil. Worship confuses the devil. You know why he hates praise and worship? He used to be in charge of it. Lucifer, his body was made up of musical instruments. He was the archangel in charge of worship. No wonder he hates praise and worship. Thank God for things that you normally don't even think of. You know what? You probably never think about thanking God for just being able to get a full breath unless you had an asthma attack or a lung disorder 
think, of, think about the people today that are thanking God for what we don't even pay any attention to. For clean water and somebody to eat a meal with. The breath that God gives us to be able to see, to be able to walk. Church, let me tell you something. No matter what your condition is, you've got plenty to be thankful for. What we're not supposed to do is complain. Now that's a good way to open a door for the devil. Simply by complaining. The Israelites did that. They murmured and grumbled and complained. We don't like this manna. And we don't like this. And we don't like that. And we don't have any water. And the Bible says 23,000 of them fell dead in one day. And then they said, oh, we have sinned. That's what it says. Oh, we have sinned. You know, isn't it a shame that our lives have to get in that kind of mess sometimes before we realize, oh, maybe I'm not doing this the right way. Maybe I'm opening a door for the devil. Now, you know, every time I have trouble, I don't go on a witch hunt trying to, you know, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? There's two times the devil comes against you in life when you do something right and when you do something wrong. And sometimes you can't figure out which it is. But it never hurts to ask, God, if I have opened a door, show me what it is so I can close it. You can open a door by going to bed angry. You can open a door by refusing to forgive people. You can open a door for the devil just by murmuring, grumbling, and complaining when we should be offering up the sacrifice of praise. You know what? And this is the honest to God's truth. It is hard for a human being to get through one whole day without complaining about something. And we don't even always have to open our mouth. Many times it's just in our attitude. <sighs> That's complaining. <sighs> That's complaining. Go to Hebrews 13, 15. <laughs> well, we made one person happy anyway. Through him, therefore, let us constantly and at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. When do we praise God? Constantly and at all times. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without complaining. All things. That means do the dishes without complaining, go to the grocery store without complaining. That means drive in traffic without complaining. Amen. Did I say something wrong? Huh? Oh, they feel guilty, okay. Don't complain about how long it takes you to get out of the parking garage after the meeting. Don't go out to the resource table and complain about the lines. Don't complain about my fog machine. Don't complain about the lights on TV. Don't complain about the fireworks. Don't come in here expecting God to bless you and get this wonderful word and then go out and let the devil steal it. Because you know what the Bible says in Mark 4? When the word is sown in our hearts, the devil comes immediately to try to take away what was sown. And you better believe this meeting won't be over five minutes and the devil will try to do something to get you to open a door so he can come in and take away what God deposited in you today. Don't let anything upset you. Don't get gossipy or judgmental or critical. You don't need to do anything but thank God. Thank you, God, I'm breathing. Thank you, I'm saved. Thank you, I got to go to the meeting today. Thank you, thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And another thing that we have to do at all times, you see, the thing you have to realize, if you're going to defeat the devil, then you've got you to be committed to do some stuff all the time. <laughs> you've got to resist the devil at all times. Not just when you feel like it, but at all times. At all times. You've got to praise God at all times. Not just when you feel like it. And another thing the Bible says we have to do at all times is pray. Ephesians 6, 18 says, pray at all times, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer. To this end, we are to watch and stay alert. Let me tell you something. If you release on the kingdom of darkness the twofold power of praise and prayer. He is not going to know what to do with you. Let me tell you something about prayer. Prayer invites the power of God into your situation. Prayer opens up the door for God to work. Prayer is one of the greatest privileges that we have. Don't overly spiritualize it. If you do, you'll miss it. I've written a book that we're going to release in 2007 called The Simple or The Power of Simple Prayer. Because I think people complicate it. We don't have to be in a certain posture, in a certain place. We don't have to say, well, when I'll pray, I'll pray about that. No, you pray right now. You can pray anywhere, at all times, on every occasion in the spirit with all manner of prayer you pray and the minute you pray the minute that you pray you're already starting the devil's defeat the minute that you pray if you're sincere in your prayer the minute that you pray you've already started the devil's downfall and you add praise with prayer when you pray and you don't see an answer right away and the devil starts to discourage you then you start praising God I thank you that my answer is on the way I thank you Lord that when I prayed you heard me and I don't see my situation yet but I believe that you're working and I believe that I'm gonna have a suddenly Woo! you should believe for suddenlies in your life I love those suddenlies. My father who sexually abused me for about 15 years, finally at the age of 80, 80, apologized to me, 80, gave his heart to Christ, asked Dave and I to baptize him, we baptized him in water. You know, that looked like the most impossible situation. I mean, everybody tried to talk to him. Nothing worked. Nothing, 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 nothing. But I didn't give up. And one day I remember driving down the road. I was going to work and I said, you know what, God? And you know, I really believe God put this in my heart to do. I said, I'm asking you as a personal favor to save him. I go all over the world and I tell everybody else what you can do for them and I see thousands of people saved. But I'm asking you as a personal favor to me, some way, somehow get to him and save him so he doesn't spend eternity in hell. I just thought it would be a great victory if the man who caused me so much anguish and so much turmoil could end up in heaven. And if I could be the one who prayed him in. Woo. Come on. We don't make the devil mad hating people. We make the devil mad when we love people. The only way you're going to get the devil back is by being good to everybody you can. You don't do unto others what they've done to you. And when we baptized him, 
he doesn't walk real good. He's got hardening of the arteries and 80 years old and gray hair. You know, I just want you to get the picture. And when we baptized him, when we lifted him up out of the water and he got out of the tank, he went across the front of the church going, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! And he's probably watching me right now talking about him because he watches my program every day. Wouldn't miss it for nothing. It was a suddenly. A suddenly. You know, Moses prayed and he said, God, show me your glory. This is in Exodus 33. God, show me your glory. I want to see your face. <laughs> and God said, no man can see my face and live, but I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. We know who our rock is. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and my glory will pass by. And you won't see my face, but you will see my backside. And I used to think, <laughs> what has that got to do with anything? And then one day God showed it to me. I mean, this is one of those revelation times for me. Let's just say that this podium represents the believer who's had a problem for 20 years. And it's one of those things that looks like, no way is this ever going to change. Now here's what's happening. You're praying, you're praising, and God's on His way. Now, you don't see Him coming. But you know what? You sure know when he's been there. And all of a sudden, you didn't see God coming, but you see the result.